Guten Morgen. <laughs> Good morning and blessed Reformation Day. Today we celebrate not merely the act of Luther nailing the 95 theses up or even presenting them, but the idea that God has not abandoned God's church and that God continues through the power of the Holy Spirit and the gospel of Jesus Christ to bring us more fully into being the people God has made us to be. That is why the cry of the Reformation is not that Reformation is done, but Semper Reformanda, always reforming. Semper Reformanda, Semper Reformanda. Good job. <laughs> there thus ends the Latin lesson for the day. Always reforming. It is good to be here together with you on this festival day and good to be with those of you who are joining us at home through God's gift of technology. It's always fun to look out and see so much red. When you come into church and the color is red, that reminds you that it is a festival that has to do with the work of the Holy Spirit. And it's always good to have visible signs and reminders of the Spirit's work among us. For our announcements today, um, if you do not already know, um, Hilda, Hilda Fredericks died earlier this week. Her funeral tom is tomorrow here at 1 p.m. There will be a viewing from 12 to 1. The burial will immediately follow the funeral, and there will be a reception here after that. Uh, Hilda's family has asked uh, in lieu of flowers that if you wish to dedicate any memorials in her honor that they would go to Christicon. Her um, grandchildren and children felt um, have loving memories of their time at that camp, and they wish to honor her memory by giving to Christicon. And then the other announcement I have is that next Sunday, the 7th of November, we are already to November, there will be a welcome meeting after church to talk about the next couple of months. So next Sunday after church, a welcome meeting. Now, next Sunday is the time change. You turn your clocks back next Saturday night. You get an extra time so you can be early for church and on time for the welcome meeting. I'm also grateful this morning that we will have help during our worship service with our confirmation students. We have four confirmands this year and they practice this Wednesday and are excited I'm saying excited, they may not feel excited. They're excited to fulfill this part of their baptismal vows, vows by helping with the worship service. I remind you that when we baptize children in this congregation or children or adults are baptized anywhere in a Christian church in the world, we all take on the responsibility of their education, praying for them and with them, helping them learn about the Bible and God's church. So. Remember that when you see the confirmation students helping with the service, they are not doing a service for you. They are doing a service with you, just as you um, have responsibilities toward them. With all that being said, I am pleased to let you know that this morning's sermon time um, will be offered to you by Dr. Martin Luther's wife, Katie Luther. She will be taking your questions about what it was like to live as Luther's wife as a woman in the medieval times, and what effect the Reformation had on her personally. Be thinking about what you've always wanted to ask Katie Luther, including possibly, who are you? Let us take a moment now to prepare our hearts and minds for worship this day. I invite you to rise as you're comfortable and able for our thanksgiving for baptism. Okay, so I'll point to you when to do it, okay. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, the fountain of living water, the rock who gave us birth, our light and our salvation. Amen. Joined to Christ in the waters of baptism, we are clothed with God's mercy and forgiveness. Here is the fountain of freedom that makes us children of God and siblings in Christ. Let us rejoice. Let us rejoice in the Lord always. From the gospel according to John. Then Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, If you continue in my word, 
you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. They answered him, We are descendants of Abraham, and have never been slaves to anyone. What do you mean by saying, You will be made free? Jesus answered them, Very truly I tell you, everyone who commits sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not have a permanent place in the household. The son has a place there forever. So if the son makes you free, you will be free indeed. We give you thanks, O God, for in the beginning your spirit moved over the waters, and by your word you created the world, calling forth life in which you took delight. By water and your word you claim us as your holy children, making us heirs of your promise and servants of all. We praise you for the gift of water that sustains life. Above all, we praise you for the gift of new life in Jesus Christ. Shower us with your spirit and renew our lives with your forgiveness, grace, and love. And of your church and of your whole creation. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. 
Gracious Father, we pray for your holy church across the world. Fill it with all truth and peace. Where it is corrupt, purify it. Where it is in error, direct it. Where in anything it is amiss, reform it. Where it is right, strengthen it. Where it is in need, provide for it. Where it is divided, unite it. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. You may be seated for the readings. Um, today's first reading is from Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 31 through 34. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, a covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, says the Lord. But this is a covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law within them and I will write to and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. No longer shall they teach one another or say to each other, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from least to from the least of them to the greatest, says the Lord. I will, forget, I will forgive their iniquities and remember their sin no more. Words of God, words for life. Thanks be to God. Um, today's psalm is 46. Please read the bold print responsively. God is our refuge and strength. A uh, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear. Though the earth be moved, though, though the mountains shake, the depths of the sea. Though it is waters rage and foam, and though the mountains tremble with its tri... Make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of the city. It, uh, it shall not be shaken. God shall help it at the break of day. The nations rage and the kingdoms shake. God speaks and the earth melts away. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our stronghold. Come now, regard the works of the Lord. What desolations God has brought upon the earth. Oh, behold the one who makes war to cease in all the world, who breaks the bow and shatters the spear and burns the shields with fire. Be still then and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our stronghold. Words of God, words for life. Thanks be to God. Our second reading is from Romans chapter 3, verses 19 through 28. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be silent, silenced, and the whole world may be held accountable to God. For no human being will be justified in his sight by deeds prescribed prescribed by the law, for though the law comes the knowledge of sin, but now apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been disclosed and is, and is attested by the law and the prophets. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no d dissension, since all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, they are now justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is Jesus Christ, whom God put forward as a sacrifice of atonement by his blood, effective through faith. 
He did this to show his righteousness because in his divine forbearance he has passed over the sins previously committed. It was to prove as the present time that he himself is righteous and that he justifies the one who has faith in Jesus. Then what becomes of boasting? It is excluded. What, uh, by what law? By that of works. No, but by the faith, by the law of faith. For we hold that a person is justified by faith apart from works prescribed by the law. Words, oh, word of God, words for life. Thanks be to God. Good job. You want to stay here through the prayers? Or do you want to go back to your seat? So you're done with the readings and you don't have to come up again till after here. Okay. Please rise for the gospel. This is the gospel of Jesus Christ, according to John. Then Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, If you continue in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. They answered him, We are descendants of Abraham and have never been slaves to anyone. What do you mean by saying you will be made free? Jesus answered them, Very truly I tell you, everyone who commits sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not have a permanent place in the household. The son has a place there forever. So if the son makes you free, you will be free indeed. This is the gospel of our Lord, the truth that sets us free. You may be seated. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Good and gracious God, with humbleness of heart, we ask that you would open our spirits, that we would hear your truth today, the glory of how your Holy Spirit has always been at work since the beginning of creation through Christ's life, death, and resurrection, through the early church, into the time of the Reformers, and that same Spirit is with us today. Guide us in all truth and courage, <clears throat> that we may truly be always reforming, coming ever closer to being the people you have made, called us, and gifted us to be. Amen. Good morning. It is an honor to be here with you today and to have the opportunity to answer questions you may have about myself, about my dear Dr. Luther, and about this time which you call the Reformation. It was a very chaotic time, many things happening, many changes in the church and in the world, and I think you can also understand because in my lifetime and affecting my family, there were many outbreaks of the Black Plague, and I understand that you are experiencing a plague yourself, and that there is a struggle to understand how to care for the neighbor and the right thing to do. And these plagues are very difficult and wearing on the spirit, and I have much compassion for you. So first, I am wondering if you have any questions for me. What was my childhood like? Short. Um, I was born in 1499, and my mother died when I was five. And shortly before I was six, my father, who was a nobleman, remarried. He, the, my new stepmother brought some children into the marriage, as well as my two brothers, whom my father had with my mother. 
And it seems that I, as the oldest girl, was not yet as helpful as I could be to the household, but I needed food and resources. And so my father drove me to a convent school, I lit, like a boarding school with nuns, but I never went home again. I grew up in the boarding school until I was 10 years old. And then when I was 10, I was fetched to the convent in Nimshin, where my aunt Magdalena was also a nun. And there I lived until I was old enough as a teenager to take the vows and become a nun. So, and the convent at Nimshin was a Cistercian, Cistercian convent. So it was very strict, very plain, a lot of silence. So from the time of my mother's death, I was taken away from my family. I did not see them again. And uh, I grew up in the convent until I escaped with other nuns in 1523. So as I said, short. Other questions? Yes. Ah, uh, yes. My dear Dr. Luther offered me 50 golden to read the Bible in a year. We have skipped from my childhood to my married life. Um, and I, I wouldn't do it. Now, here is what I said to him. I have heard enough. I have read enough. I know enough. Would to God that I would do what is in the Bible instead of reading it more. The issue was really, which my Dr. Luther did not consider, is that I rose at four every morning. This is why he called me the morning star of Wittenberg. I worked all day long. Sometimes I sat at table and discussed things with Dr. Luther and his students. I went to bed at nine o'clock. I got up and do it again. To read the Bible in a year takes a dedicated amount of time every day. I could read because I learned to read in Latin, in Greek, and in German in the convent which was one of the few ways a girl could be educated in my time. But if my dear Dr. Luther wanted me to read the Bible in a year, he needed to find someone to brew his beer, make his sausage, change his bed store, raise his children, fight, uh, keep his books, tend the garden, clean the house. You see where I'm going with this? <laughs> the other thing is that our Dr. Luther was not so good with the money and he made me the keeper of the household books, why would I give myself 50 golden? <laughs> so that is the answer to that question. It is not that I had never read the Bible or that I didn't like it, but I did not have time. We did not have the money. And I still read my Psalms. We prayed every day. And I was very familiar with and used Dr. Luce's catechism, which I commend to all of you. I, there is a question here. I did escape the convent in Nimshin. So you all know, because you are celebrating today, the start of Dr. Luther's reforms to the church in 1517, yes? So as this began to happen, things, rumors came to convents and to cloisters where monks were, and we began to hear of changes to the church. I hear whispers from the man who brings the fish to the convent. Now, in my convent, as I said, there is much silence, but we pass each other on the way to prayers, and maybe we slip each other a note that we burn later. Perhaps we are doing the weeding in the garden, and we say something to one another. So I and 11 nuns have heard of what is happening to the church, particularly Dr. Luther's statements that monks and nuns are doing something that is not in the Bible. They are believing themselves to be higher than other people uh, who are all God's children. And this affects my heart. I do not think I am better than other people. And I do not know if I am truly serving Jesus, if I am not in a place where I can care for all my neighbors, even though my sisters in the convent were truly neighbors. So I and 11 nuns make a plan on the night of Holy Saturday in 1523, there is a man who is from Wittenberg who is going to come and get us around two in the morning. 
The reason this is critical is because the first Easter celebration, the one that happens at midnight, will be over. All of the higher up nuns will be very tired because we have celebrated and prepared for Easter all day. They go to sleep. We slip out with nothing but our habits. We took nothing else. We get in his cart. Some of us have to sit in the barrels that carried herring. We are covered up with a cloth, and we are driven straight from Nimchen to Wittenberg to Dr. Luther himself. It was a shock to our system, particularly for me, having been inside cloister walls since I was five. And yet, I believed truly in my heart that I was being who Jesus wished me to be. And then it opened opportunities for us to perhaps be teachers. And most of us became wives and mothers, something that God intended for us and helped us to understand more about God. Does that answer your question? Well, we're probably going to get around to this, but I always assumed Luther was a Catholic priest. <laughs> and, and therefore, he's married. But, so, Are you the, like so many people thought that I was a, a witch, and I bewitched Luther into marrying me. Do you think that? Okay, good. <laughs> then I will explain to you. My dear Dr. Luther, who had trained as a lawyer, and then, as you know, in a severe thunderstorm, made a promise to St. Anne that if St. Anne would preserve his life, he would, in, he would enter religious order. So he becomes an Augustinian monk. And he is an Augustinian monk for a very long time until he, through the Holy Spirit, has his epiphanies and wishes not to make new church, but to bring church back to the gospel. So, because after the Diet of Worms, the Catholic Church excommunicates him, for a while there is price on his head, when he is excommunicated, he still loves Jesus, he still wishes to worship, to receive communion, but he is not able to do so in a Catholic church. So there is a whole new church for Dr. Luther. He and friends, Eustace Jonas, Philip Melanchthon, George Spalatin, others, they are figuring out what is the bedrock, the bottom of what the church is meant to be in Jesus. So after he is excommunicated, he is no longer a Catholic priest, he is just priest. He is no longer a Catholic monk, he is just monk. Many people, including Eustace Jonas and Philip Melanchthon, think that even though Luther helped nuns escape, that it is not for him to marry, that he will be distracted, that the peasants' war is happening, and he will not be able to be a good moral example of encouragement if he has wife, and with wife often comes children. They are worried about this distraction. But Luther, because he is writing new theology all the time, what does it mean not to be Catholic? What does it mean to be able to read the Bible in your own language? What does it mean if we do not need priests to intercede for us? He writes, what does it mean to be married? It is hard to write, what does it mean to be married if you have not been married? So when I am 20, um, and I am 26, and he is 42, we get married, and suddenly now he knows what it means to be married. <laughs> now, I remind you that my dear Dr. Luther, as a monk and I as a nun, had taken vows, vows of poverty, vows of chastity, vows of obedience. At the time, the church really believed only if you are in the cloister can you truly be poor, obedient and chaste. But as Dr. Luther and I discovered in our marriage, if you are truly only giving to your spouse what is owed to your spouse, it is a kind of chastity. And if you have ever run a cloister where students are coming all the time to learn from your husband and you have six children, two died, and you are caring for many people in the town, then you do truly know what poverty is. And if you are willing to say yes to who God is calling you to be, including perhaps married, even though your friends do not like it, 
then you know true obedience. So I believe in my heart, and Dr. Luther believed too, that we continued our poverty, our chastity, and our obedience, just not as we had originally meant them when they were our first vows. Does this answer your question? Thank you. Yes. Ah, danke schön. Uh, Elector John Frederick gave to my husband, Dr. Luther, what is called the Black Cloister. The Black Cloister had been part of an Augustinian monastery and university in Wittenberg. When I come to Dr. Luther as a bride, the Black Cloister is very run down. This is what comes of having men all the time who are very smart here and do not think about too much else. In fact, I tell you this, Dr. Luther did not change the straw in his bed before our wedding night. <laughs> Welcome, Katie. But we live in the Black Cloister and everyone comes to meet with Dr. Luther. So the Black Cloister has 40 rooms. Often all 40 rooms were filled. We have myself and the good Dr. Luther we have our six children, so Elisabetta and Magdalena died. So our four surviving children, we take in six of our nieces and nephews to raise them. We are willing to care for some victims of the Black Plague. And then always there are theology students and friends of the doctor coming and staying with us to be present at his table talks, to help him with his papers, to pray with him, and to ask questions of him. So as you can see, I am running a household often with more than 40 people, with 40 full rooms. So I have gardens in the Black Cloister, but I also have gardens in the nearby village of Zusorf and other properties as well, because I am having to feed sometimes 80 to 100 people, which is daily beer, uh, one or two meals a day, uh, care for victims of the plague and other illnesses, and care of my children and other people's children as well. So. I was very busy, which returns to your question of why did I not sit down to read the Bible? <laughs> so that is how we lived. It was a busy life, but also a blessed life, a life where every day we were able to see God's work and God's gifts to us in our children, in the family we were able to care for, and in those who came to us and knew that they would be received. Yes. Okay, so when, number one, you mentioned rooming beer. Yes. Number one, when did you have time to do that in your, you know, in your spare time? And I heard that Dr. Luther loved your beer more than any other. <laughs> and what is your brewing sequence? Well, yes. My Dr. Luther wrote in many of his letters, not only to me when he missed me, but also to his friends that he loved my beer the best. Now, beer takes some time, so it is not as though I brew new beer every day. I have to add the hops, I keep the yeast going. Um, the big secret to my beer, the only one I will tell, is this. Before I come to Wittenberg, and I'm married to Dr. Luther, and I'm running the Black Cloister, the people of Wittenberg throw their trash in the River Elbe. They empty their waste buckets, they empty their food scraps, perhaps their um, dead animal who die of sickness, they can't eat, all go in the river. You cannot be brewing beer with dirty water. So if I talk to the elector of our area, I talk to the chancellor of Wittenberg, I insist that for our community, the Elbe must be clean and there must be a law against throwing trash in the river. After they taste my beer, they see the good value of this. And so a law is passed, a law for clean water. And that clean water for the Elva River, along with the wheat I grow, the wild yeast that surely comes on the power of the Holy Spirit with the good ideas of the Reformation, these are the secrets to my beer, my beer that keep Dr. Luther healthy, as healthy as he could be, um, that he loved so always kept him coming back to me. And I will tell you this as well. 
Perhaps you are not using your water for beer, but keeping your water clean is very important. Important for health, important for the community. Perhaps you have rivers near here, keeping them clean, it's a good idea. You, you may wish to know that 500-year-old beer is not the same as 500-year-old wine and does not keep as one thinks it might, but I do accept invitations to drink beer with you. <laughs> Other questions? What impact do your marriage have on our information? Is this the last question? We are ready for the last question. What impact do I think my marriage had on the Reformation? First, it is a humble thing to think that I had any impact on the Reformation. People remember me and there is much writing about me as feisty, as bossy, as shrill, but it is hard for you to understand how sick Dr. Luther could be, how the melancholy would tug at his heart from Satan. And I think that my marriage meant that Dr. Lived, Dr. Luther lived longer than he might have, that he had a home where other people learned and could continue his reforms. And most importantly, prior to Dr. Luther's marriage and I, with me, there were priests who sometimes took a woman, but they could not marry her. Any children could not inherit. And so our marriage is the first marriage for people to see a priest and a wife of a priest, a man who is dedicated to the church and a woman who is dedicated to her man. This is a very big deal because if Going forward, the priests would be permitted to marry. Their spouses need to know what it means to be supportive and holy and helpful, thinking not only about the spouse, but about the community who comes to them and the community who watches them. So I know that sometimes I am called the mother of the Reformation this feels complicated to me because I do not feel I gave birth to the Reformation. Perhaps I am more the midwife of the Reformation. I helped as it was being born. I cleaned it up and I showed to the world, this is a healthy thing which God intends to live. Of all the things that I could tell you about living with Dr. Luther, the thing I think you should know that always grieved him and some of you may know how angry he could be at the end of his life. He was grieved at how the church seemed to be dividing. And at the end of the Reformation, there was almost less unity than there had been at the beginning. But I am certain, because I have heard, I am hearing, that the Roman Catholic Church underwent a counter-Reformation, I am certain that in your time, these divisions have been solved and the Church of Christ is unified. Yes? Yes? No? Well, then I would encourage you, in the spirit of Dr. Luther, man and woman, to continue to work, to work to bring the church together, to work to bring it back to the truth of the gospel, and to remember that the same spirit that my husband had, may he be blessed and peace in heaven, the same spirit that he had, the same spirit that was in our Lord Jesus Christ, is in you. And may it be strengthened until the day when Jesus returns. Amen. Amen. <laughs>
We will now say together the truths that are the bedrock of the Luther's faith and ours by using the Apostles' Creed. I believe in the God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. We have received the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into heaven. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and seated in the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Set free from sin and death and nourished by the word of truth, we join in prayer for all of God's creation. We pray for all who long for the word of truth and for the radical grace that flows from the cross. Inspire congregations to freely and boldly pro proclaim your love for all people with present pr pr persistence and hope. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. We pray for your creation for mountains, rivers, streams, cities, homesteads, and neighborhoods. Write in our hearts a new love and care for creation. Give us the will to curb wasteful habits and to hold accountable those who neglect the vulnerable. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. We pray for all who aspire a spare to public office um, and the election in our own community this week. Pour wisdom and understanding upon all who govern so that the community, communities of justice and peace may thrive. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. We pray for all who long for healing in mind, body, and spirit. Strengthen hospitals, clinics, counseling centers, nursing homes, and recovery centers to be holy spaces of renewal that all might live an abundant life in you intent. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. We pray for all who seek to grow in faith and love of you, guide teaching and learning and confirmation, Bible studies, Sunday school, youth groups, schools, seminaries, and universities. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. We give thanks to all the saints and reformers who have gone before us, who dwell in your holy habitation, especially Katie Luther. Give us courage through their example to challenge injust injustice and work towards life-giving reformation. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. Condemn, uh, condemn, mm. Confined that you hear us, O oh Lord, we boldly place our prayers into your hands through Jesus Christ, our truth and life. Amen. 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 Please rise. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We let us give thanks to the Lord our God. We praise you, O Holy God, our Maker, our Judge, our Keeper. For the universe beyond our knowledge, for the seas and forests and fields, for creatures seen and unseen, for animals both wild and tame, for our ancestors and our parents from around the world, and for the places we humans call home, for churches and cities and schools, for seminaries and missions and fellowship halls. We praise you for your covenant people, for Moses and Miriam and Aaron, for Jeremiah and the 
and for centuries of faithful Christians, for Mary Magdalene, Peter, and Paul, for Luther, Melanchthon, Muhlenberg, and Fede, for Katie Luther and Cranach, for Bach and Nikolai, Nomensen and Kierkegaard, Bonhoeffer and Hammerskjold. For all of the Reformation. We praise you, O God, for Jesus Christ, who saves us from sin and from evil. On the night before he died, Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to all his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And again, after supper, he took the cup. He gave thanks, gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. And so we remember the living word, his life, his death, and his glorious resurrection, his presence in this meal around the world. And we proclaim the mystery of our faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. We pray, O oh God, for your spirit, your breath, your fire, your wisdom, your law, your grace, your freedom. Bless this meal and all who share it. Inspire your people for service. Continue the reformation of your churches and renew the world with your mercy, with your healing, with your justice and your peace, with the joy of life in your household. We praise you, almighty and holy God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Mighty fortress, victorious champion, power for shield. Today, tomorrow, and forever. Amen. Believing in what God has done for us through Jesus Christ, we are bold to ask to be part of that ongoing work in the world by praying as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. All who hunger and thirst come, the table is ready, for Christ has made it so. It is Christ's own righteousness that makes, us, makes this meal possible, feeds our faith, and fills us with the Spirit. You may be seated. The ushers will help you. You can come up. The ushers will dismiss you row by row. Um, Ron, can you help Zoe Usher since it's her first time? Okay. I need my mask first. One, one thing at a time. Okay. All right, so the person who does the tray has a line. You know the line. The blood of Christ shed for you. Do you want to do it or do you want to do a basket? Or you can switch sides. So you would hold this. Okay. They just put their cup in it. Take that one first.
May the body and blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, strengthen you and keep you in God's grace now and forever. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray together. Blessed Jesus, at this table you have been for us both host and meal. Now send us forth to extend our tables and to share your gifts until that day when all feast together at your heavenly banquet. Amen. Please rise. We're going to be singing all the verses of To God Be the Glory. this blessing from our Lord. God, the beginning and the end, has written your name in the book of life. God bless you, keep you in grace and peace from this time forth and evermore. Amen. Led by the saints before us, go in peace to serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.